This morning we have a, a special friend with us today. Uh, Kevin Beeson is one of the leaders of LifeLinks International, and it's the international network of churches that Harvest City is a part of, and Kevin is one of the leaders of that team, and he's here this weekend because of the LifeLinks AMP training program that's taking place out at Dallas Valley, and so it's a great opportunity to have him come and share with us. He pastors a church in Lewiston, Idaho. And it has just grown by, what, two, three hundred people in, what, the last two weeks? The last month? The last few months. Because they did something amazing. They joined forces with another church in town to become a mega force in their city. And uh, recently there was a story on them in the front page of the local newspaper just talking about, you know, churches are supposed to be in competition with each other, and yet you guys have joined forces to be bigger and better What's going on here? And so God is doing great things in Lewiston. And uh, Kevin is a great leader and great communicator. So let's welcome him as he comes this morning to share the word of God with us. Bless you, Kevin. Well, many of you know, it's, it's a thrill to be here. Uh, many of you know that uh, my wife and I, Shelly, we have a couple of sons. Uh, one of them just turned 22, and then we have an 11-year-old son, Rowan, who we adopted from China when he was two. And I have a fresh Rowan story for you. Uh, they come regularly, but this one happened literally this last Wednesday morning. We're on the way to school, and we pick up a couple other kids uh, on, the road, on the way to school, and they're sitting in the back seat, Shelly and I are in the front seat, and Rowan just out of the blue... He's very stoic, by the way. Out of the blue, he says, hey, Dad. I said, yes. He said, since the days of your youth have passed. <laughs> he goes, are you going to start calling us whoopersnappers? Like, you little whoopersnapper, what are you doing back there, you kids? Anyway, I just was so flabbergasted that he said, since the days of your youth have passed. I am just turned 51. I don't know what triggered this for him. But I, anyway, so I say that because you had all these cute kids up here for dedications. I have a couple of cute kids, but one of them is really challenging. You need to pray for us. I mean, this little guy, he's, he's always on us. And, he's, and he, he giggled. He thought it was funny. And anyway, it's good stuff. Well, I'm thrilled to, to share a message with you today on change and taking a next step. I have a question. How many of you know somebody near you, around your life, that needs some change? Any, anybody? Okay, everybody should be raising their hand on this one. Maybe you're, are, I hear Canadians are silently rebellious. Is that true? Somebody told me that this week. I don't think that's true. You're kind people. Uh, but how about, how about so, you, so some of you know, how about in your own life, do you think there's anything that maybe you could say could use a little change? Yeah. How about some big change? Yeah. I, I would agree with that, and I would agree in my own life it's the same way. And I, what I've, I've listened to the last four messages here at Harvest City, enjoyed every one of them. And the Ready for Takeoff series, and then Pastor Dave uh, bringing a great word as well. And Joel really challenged us. He said, in that first message, he said, let your light shine. Are you ready for takeoff? He said, let your light shine. And then he said, don't forget you're already positioned. Don't miss the season that you're in. Don't miss it. And then, he, and then in, the, in the second message, he, he said, remember, it's, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that actually powers you to, to, to accomplish the mission in which, and the call in which God has placed in your life. And, th and then he had this great warning. He said, refuse to be a cynic. He said, watch cynicism. Watch that. Listen, cynicism is a punk. <laughs> it's a punk. Just refuse to go there. It's easy to drift into that place of cynicism. And then Pastor Dave came in and he gave, gave this great word from Romans 7 where he, as I listened to it, the, the line that stood out to me was, it's not about what I need to do, it's about who. Who, who is the issue? Who causes the change? It's not you and I working harder to change. It's about who brings the change. And when we keep our focus on who, Jesus, who brings the change, then change really starts to happen. And I liked how he ended that message. He said, take steps to get closer. Just what our part 
is to get closer, lean in. And then last week, Pastor Joel brought this great word about consecrating yourself. This great Christian word, consecrate, which really means set yourself apart. It, it means choose God's will and his agenda first. Not your will or my will, but God's will first. It, and so, and so I, I, I want to I key off of this, those messages to really this decision that you made last week, some of you. Some of you weren't here last week, but you can make that decision today to just say you're fully in. You're saying, yes, Jesus, I'm fully surrendered. You're not just my Savior, you're my Lord. But, the, you know, it's, it's great to do that. You've got to make that decision. But then how do you walk this thing out? Right? I think that's the challenge. And I think sometimes we think it's huge, massive events. And we have some events, that, or we think there's just this, you know, oh, holy experience. It's gonna, the angels are going to start singing, and if that happens, amazing. But that doesn't usually happen every day. And there's this verse and, and I don't have it on the screen, but you can write it down if you want. Hebrews 10, 14. And basically it says, He, by, the, by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Or those who are being sanctified. He being Jesus. Jesus, for, by, by that offering, by his sacrifice, forever made us perfect. So we, that's our position in Christ. When we're in Christ, when we're saved, when we've said yes to Jesus... We're in right standing. But I love this verse because it, sh it shows us that part. That's our position in Christ, our true identity in him. But yet, we are being made holy. There's a process of sanctification, a process of growing up into who we already are in Christ. And I believe that that happens by daily, small, little steps of obedience. And so that's what I want to show you today in the scripture. We're going to be in Mark 10. If you have a Bible, turn there. It'll be on the screen as well. Or your app, turn there. And the context of this is Jesus is in his final weeks. He's been with his disciples. He's at the end of his three and a half years on this planet. It has been an amazing three and a half years. I mean, miracle after miracle. The, the feeding of the 5,000. And he didn't just feed him exactly enough, he, he went over the top and had baskets left over. And he's on his way to Jerusalem. And, and the disciples that are with him for these three and a half years, he's been giving them clues, but they're really pretty clueless about what's about to happen. They, they just aren't picking up on it. I mean, in their mind, Jesus is at the height of his popularity, at the height of his ministry. I mean, the fruit is dripping off the trees. It's incredible. And, and we know that he was so close to going to the cross, but even his closest followers couldn't comprehend it. And it's here, as they're leaving Jericho, and they're on their way to Jerusalem, that he encounters this blind man named Bartimaeus. I call him B.B. Blind Bartimaeus. So if I refer to B.B., you'll know who it is, all right? It's a little easier to say. There's tons of people around because they're all getting ready for Passover and the people are coming in towards Jerusalem and so there's a lot of activity, a lot of buzz in the city. But this blind man, Bartimaeus, I mean, he, was, he had to beg to survive. In those days, there was no social services. You were, considered, that was, you were considered a disfavored by God if you were blind and, and we know that's not true, but that was the case back then. And so his only means of support was begging. And so he's along the high traffic roads, because that's where the people are, and that's where he can get some coin. And so I really believe this passage is not just about the healing of a blind person, which is amazing and a great miracle, and we want to see more of that. But don't miss the other things that are going on as we read this. There's other things happening here. I, there is transformation. There is big change that happens in this passage, more than just physical sight, he gets his spiritual sight. But he takes some steps, some very clear steps in here, and I want to highlight those to you. So let's read the passage, Mark 10, 46 to 52. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus' disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. 
A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, or Bibi, as I call him, was sitting by the roadside begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 49, Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. So I want to unpack this for you. I see three things here. There's more than three, but I see three things I want to highlight to you. Now, Bartimaeus, remember, he was poor. He was blind. He was powerless. He was an outcast. He was really a man with no hope in that society. And all of that, maybe more, draws him to a place that I think maybe many of us can relate with. It's a place of dissatisfaction. And, and there's, I want to give you the takeaway line for today. If you take nothing else away from this, take this line away. Big change flows from little steps of obedience. Big change flows from little steps of obedience. I think that one of the ways that we're going to see here, but we see it in our life, that change happens and obedience is sparked, it starts with a place of dissatisfaction. First point is he was dissatisfied. Bartimaeus, go to the next slide if you, he was, he was dissatisfied with his current condition. Now there, I realize in this place today, this morning, there are people in different places. There are some of you here, you're seeking truth, you're, you're not a Christ follower yet. But you showed up today, and I'm so proud of you for being here. We're grateful you're here. But you want truth. You want what's, what's really true. I don't want religion. Let me just give you a secret. We don't want religion either. <laughs> we want Jesus. We want God, the one who made us and created us, and we want to introduce you to him. Some of you are here, and you've surrendered your life to Christ already, and and, and, you're, and you're excited. You, you, you see God doing a deep work in you. And some of you have made that decision that, and you made it maybe even last week, afresh, to say, I, God, I want to do your will, not mine. I'm going to consecrate myself. I am ready to go into this next season of what you have, and I'm going to take hold of what I currently have as well. But there are also some of you here who, Jesus is your Savior. Like, you're going to heaven but, but you are, you are, he is not your Lord. He is not your master. Craig Rochelle says it this way, you're a Christian atheist. You believe in God, but you live as if he doesn't exist. You're a full-time Christian and a part-time follower of Jesus. And if I'm honest, I've had those seasons in my life. And I know you have too, and that, I believe that's what Joel was, God was using Joel to do, is to stir us up to go, let's not, let's not shrink, let's not go to, get into comfort mode, let's not just, it's just so easy, we're West, if we're here in this Western world, it's just so easy to get caught up in so much that's going on, and forget that the main thing is the main thing, and Jesus is the main thing, and what he's called us to do. But I see that Bartimaeus, back to this, Bartimaeus, his dissatisfaction begs, it begs for a new reality. His dissatisfaction begs for a new reality. And I think you're going to see here that that gets fulfilled. It does. But it, but it starts with this holy irritation, if you will. And I have this on the screen, that your dissatisfaction is an indicator light on the dashboard of your next step of faith. Your dissatisfaction is an indicator light on the dashboard of your next step of faith. I really believe that. But you have a choice when you're dissatisfied. You can head down a path of self-indulgence and looking in all the wrong places. Or you can say, maybe this dissatisfaction is God helping me see that I don't have to stay stuck here. I want to tell you a story where I was recently dissatisfied. 
our son, Rowan, who I mentioned, the 11-year-old, needed some serious dental surgery, and so we went to the doctor. The oral surgeon recommended I need to do these bone grafts. It was really involved surgery. He was a cleft lip palate kid. And so the doctor was, you know, we're Americans, so our insurance is different than you all. And um, so right now, my wife and I, we have this sharing, medical sharing thing, but basically we pay out of pocket for everything. And so the doctor, the surgeon was going to be $5,000. That's a big chunk, but doable. We're like, he needs it, we've got to figure it out, we'll do it. And the doctor, the surgeon says, I want to use the local hospital to do the surgery. But my part is 5000 Just talk to the hospital about their part. So the hospital calls me. Range said, we've got, we've got Rowan scheduled in for the surgery. I said, great. I said, how much, how much is your portion going to be? And the lady on the other end of the line says, uh, it'll be $96,000. And, I, and I, I kind of did the same thing and laughed. I went, ha! <laughs> I said, did, did, did you say $9,600? And she said, no, $96,000. And I went, <laughs> you'd be proud of me. I didn't cuss. I didn't freak out. I, I just, I went, wow. I said, I, go, I just can't imagine that an outpatient surgery, the hospital portion is $96,000. I said, can you rerun those numbers? And she goes, you know, it does seem a little high. I said, yeah, a little high. And she says, I'll, 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 I'll rerun the numbers. She goes, I just quoted a hip surgery, and it was only 39000 I said, I can get that. That's multiple days in the hospital. That's, you know. I said, yeah, please rerun the numbers. That would be really great. So I get off the phone. And she gets back to me a little later, <laughs> a few days later, actually. I waited. But in the, in the in-between time, I called the surgeon back, and I talked to him. I said, this is what I'm getting from the hospital. I said, do you have, I go, is there any other alternative? Because I go, this is, I go, that's a mortgage payment. I mean, I don't know what, I mean, I can't even afford the down payment on that right now. What's happening here? And um, she goes, oh, yeah, th- there's some surgery centers sometimes the doctor uses. We could use that. I said, that'd be great. So she ends up booking the surgery center. Guess how much the surgery center was? $1,600. One thousand six hundred dollars, thousand for the, <laughs> anesthe- the, 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 the place and six hundred for the anesthesia. I'm like, you know, and then I started thinking. I'm like, is it really like a decrepit place? Like, is it terrible <laughs> care? I don't want Rowan to be a bad care. And anyway, so she goes, Oh no, it's great. It works great. He uses it all the time. I'm like, I go, What's going on? So I call the, I call the hospital back. She she calls me back. She goes, Oh, our numbers were way off. I go, Really? She goes, yeah, it's only going to be $60,000. <laughs> so, why do I tell you that story? In, in, in the midst of that, the number was so outrageous. Because I think if she would have said 9600 I would have went, eh, that's high, but okay. We'll figure it out. But the fact that it was so crazy and so outrageous, I'm like, this is not right. I did actually pray. I just, you'd be encouraged. Um, <laughs> I did pray. I got off the phone. I'm like, I talked to Shelly. I go, we just got to pray because Rowan needs this. We have to do this, but we cannot afford this. And, I did, and then, we called, then I called the doctor, and that's when we found out it would be 1600 I just, but that dissatisfaction <laughs> drove me to take some more alternative action. I thought, you know, if it would have been six grand, five grand, 9600 I probably would have just paid it. But even in our own lives, I think sometimes we settle we don't pray, and we don't ask God, and we don't, we don't look into some things. We don't go, God, why am I dissatisfied here? What's going on? What are you up to? Is there a step of faith you want me to take? So Bartimaeus, back to him. He was dissatisfied with his current condition. But number two is he sees Jesus as the solution, as a solution. But look at this in 47 and 48. He says, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him, told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. I think there's a next slide. Go to the next slide if you would. I want you to notice this comma. (laughs) Probably don't see that highlighted a lot in sermons. They just don't get the cred they need, those commas. (laughs) But this comma, in my mind, 
is such a big deal. Because right here, blind Bartimaeus, when he heard, first of all, he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. Pause. Something happened right in this space that I think is so important. There was a moment of decision. There was a whole bunch of things, I believe, that flooded back into Bartimaeus' mind. The word heard, when he heard. So something was happening. Remember, he was blind. His hearing is heightened. He's on the busy road. All the people are going by. I believe, we don't know from Scripture, all we know is this word heard. It says he had heard of this Jesus. I believe for three and a half years, he'd been hearing the buzz. He'd been hearing the chatter. He'd been hearing about the miracles. He'd even heard about some blind, other blind guy that got healed with some mud and some spit. Very unconventional. Don't recommend that technique for healing for you. But Jesus, he's Jesus. He'll do what he's going to do. And I believe that as Bartimaeus was hearing these stories, that, and that he was like, maybe there's, He starts that dissatisfaction that maybe there's some hope. (laughs) Maybe there's, maybe my condition can change. And and something starts to rise up in him, some faith even, to go, maybe I don't have to be stuck. Maybe I can contribute in the community in a different way. Maybe I can start doing roofs uh, roofs for for Ron with Hope Construction. Maybe, Maybe I can get a job over at Safeway. Maybe I can start throwing freight for Costco. Maybe I don't have to be the guy on the side of the road begging. And and, and a vision, I believe, starts to form in him. From the information he had, he'd heard about this Jesus. About this Jesus. And, And he'd even heard, because he calls him the son of David. So he he knew that there was importance to Jesus beyond just the miracles that he was royalty maybe he was even the Messiah because he acknowledges and calls him by a royal identity and I think all the words and the thoughts and the stories and the testimony (laughs) because when testimonies are shared faith gets ignited if you can do it for them maybe you can do it for me And I believe that when you consecrate yourself, when you say, yes, Jesus, your agenda first, I believe God will plant more vision in you, and vision starts to grow, and the place that you're currently at, you start to get dissatisfied, even in some areas of your own life, that maybe you've just been managing. Or maybe there's some people that you know you're supposed to share Jesus with, And you haven't done it, but you start to get dissatisfied and go, maybe, okay, I can do this. And so, this dissatisfaction, this holy irritation, brings Bartimaeus to his next step. He sees Jesus as the solution, and then he gets up, and he starts shouting, (laughs) Jesus, Jesus. And, and, I, and, and I just, I, I think about this. It, it says here that he shouted in verse 47, and he shouted all the more. And in between that, it, people start rebuking him. Shut up, Bartimaeus. Stop it. This is Jesus. He's busy. He's got a lot on his mind. He's got a lot of people to reach and, and touch. But this resistance fueled his tenacity. It propelled him to lean in and grab a hold of a fresh vision of a changed life. Let resistance be a catalyst for you getting closer to Jesus. Let resistance be a catalyst for you and I getting closer to Jesus. Because big change flows from little steps of obedience. And I believe Bartimaeus' first step was just to believe that Jesus was a solution. That he was the answer. But then he stands on that comma at the precipice. And he, but he's, he obviously says yes because his next step is 
He starts yelling. He tries to get Jesus' attention. He's shouting. And even when resistance comes, he starts shouting all the more because he's like, he is the answer. I think something's rising. He's like, he's the one. He can do this. I can be different. And then B.B., blind Bartimaeus, gets a glimpse of Jesus' love. And I like what Tozer says, A.W. Tozer. He says, our Lord told his disciples that love and obedience were organically united. The final test of love is obedience. And in verse 49, Jesus stops. And he said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Jesus is calling you. Come on. And Jesus stops and calls, and and Bartimaeus has to make another choice. Is he going to take a next step of obedience? It's one thing to get Jesus' attention. It's a big thing. But I just want you to know, Bartimaeus' cry and shout stops God. (laughs) And when you and I call out, I believe he hears, he listens, he stops and says, get closer. But in that moment, I think he's, he's got the question. He's got to answer this question. Do I, do I stand? Do I go? Or do I stay sitting here? Do I really want to do this? Am I going to respond to the invitation? I got his attention. I wasn't sure I was going to. But now what do I do? He does it. He gets up. But not only does he get up, he gets up with gusto, panache, with style. He goes for it. Look what it says. Jesus stopped and said, call him so they... So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. And verse 50, throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet. Jumps to his feet, and he came to Jesus. So that's my third point. He throws off his cloak. Now, this is probably, this is a nice fuzzy blanket, but this is the best cloak I could get. The blind in those days would have a distinctive cloak. They'd use it for warmth, for shade from the sun, but one of the big things they did was they'd lay it out in front of them, and it was an indicator to those around them, this is a blind man, and they, could, they weren't supposed to touch him, that was, he was unclean in that sense and disfavored, so throw the coins on the blanket, throw the coins on the cloak, and, and I just want you to think about what that cloak meant to that blind man, to Bartimaeus, it was his identity. It was his means of provision. It, it was something that was always with him. It was a security blanket, a security cloak. And in that moment, I think it's so fascinating that it gets put here in this scripture. The first thing he does, the first big action. And remember, he has not been healed yet. He's still blind. And he throws his cloak off. He gets up. And he's only, he's only hearing the voice. He's over there. He gets up and he starts to walk to Jesus. And his small steps, laying aside his identity, not knowing even where he threw it, not knowing if he's going to be healed for sure. And he goes to Jesus. And when he gets there, Jesus says to him, I love this. He says, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I love this. I want to see. And as as I thought about that, that interaction, I thought, you know what I love about Jesus? Is Jesus could have, from a distance... When he got, when he heard, oh, this guy's yelling at you. I can hear him. He's a blind man. Be healed. From a distance, he could have easily done that, right? But he doesn't. He invites him to get closer. He says, come. He's helping Bartimaeus walk small steps of obedience. Take small steps. Bring him in close. To have relationship. Our God isn't just trans, he's not a transactional God, he's a relational God that can do things 
amazing things. He wants to bring change, but he, he wants relationship in the context of relationship to do those changes. And Jesus isn't afraid of your questions. Maybe he's asking you today, what do you want me to do? I think a better question is, Jesus, what do you want me to do? But it might just be, Jesus, I just want you to know I need you. I see you as the solution to everything in my life. As I looked through this, I was also noticing that blind Bartimaeus was making little steps of his little steps of obedience. His prayer life even grows in this passage. I don't know if you noticed this, but he, in verse 47, he shouts. <laughs> That's a good start for your prayer life. And then he says in verse 48, have mercy on me. And then in verse 51, I want to see. And I see this growth in Bartimaeus in this short little passage. And then verse 52, go said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. You see this progression from rescue to relationship. And it all happened because blind Bartimaeus took next steps, small steps of faith. And, and a big change flows in Bartimaeus' life because he took little steps of faith. But it started with a holy dissatisfaction. And that day, he became a follower of Jesus, fully seeing physically, but fully seeing spiritually as well. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, one act of obedience is better than 100 sermons. I don't know what your cloak is today. Some of you, your next step might just be to throw that cloak off. Maybe that cloak is, maybe you really struggle with people pleasing. Maybe you're here and you're harboring unforgiveness towards someone in your family or someone at work. Maybe it's a sense of entitlement. Maybe it's comparison. Maybe it's a poverty mentality. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe you've been avoiding a conversation that you know you need to have and you are definitely sensing the Holy Spirit causing a holy dissatisfaction in you that you can't just stay stuck and not deal with this thing. I want to encourage you today that you can throw your cloak aside. When you see Jesus as the solution, you don't have to rest in this identity anymore. Pray with me today. Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture that has so many things, God. We thank you for the transformation, the change, the big change that happened in Bartimaeus' life. And God, I, I learned so much from this. And God, in this place, there are people who, Lord, there's, there's things that, cloaks, if you will, that they've been holding on to and maybe even holding as a sense of identity some of you here that have been embracing victim, you're just a victim and right now the Holy Spirit's like that's you and, and, and God just says Give, do an exchange today with me look to me I'll take that and I'll give you my identity your true identity everybody's eyes closed I'm not going to have you come to the front, but I, I just, I'd be curious, how many of you would say, Kevin, there is a cloak. I know there's something I need to lay aside and do an exchange with Jesus with. It's just, just with a raise of your hands, you say, yeah, that's me. Okay. 
Hands all over the place. You can put them down. Let's pray. I'm going to pray for you right now that you would do that. Just Would you just give that to Jesus and just exchange it for his peace, for his faith. Just draw close to him. Jesus, we give you these cloaks. We give you these things that so easily entangle us. We lay them aside and we come to you. We get closer. (laughs) And would you help us to just take the next small step, the little step of faith, of an, an obedience, that we would obey, we'd listen and obey, we'd listen and obey, that our daily rhythm would be one of just listening and obeying and repenting when we need to, and, and we just keep baby stepping closer to you and walking into everything you've called us to, just one small step at a time, just like Saul on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, you When he said to you, he asked a question, Lord, what do you want me to do? (laughs) And Jesus, you didn't say to Paul, I want you to write the New Testament, and I want you to do all these amazing things of reaching the Gentiles. You just said, arise, go to the street called straight, and then I'll tell you what you're supposed to do there. You're kind to us, God. Every one of us, you just give us small steps, I believe. 98% of the time, small steps of obedience to take. 